Hello, welcome back. This is the Division of Education, Innovation and Energy e-learning program. And I am Ms. Jamila Amin Bacchus, your facilitator for Cape Biology. In particular today, we will be looking at Unit 2 Biology and we will be reviewing one of the topics you would have done in Module 1, which is respiration. Our last video looked at photosynthesis and so you will see some similarities and you will see the way in which the energy that was trapped in photosynthesis is now going to be released in this process of respiration. Before we go forward, I want to remind you students that there are different levels to what this topic will entail. And so in some quarters, you will see a lot of information regarding this topic. Some go very in depth. That's fine if you wish you, and you can grasp the understanding, by all means go ahead. But please, I urge you to look at your syllabus. Your syllabus is your guide as to what you will be examined on in the CXC exam. So I urge you to pay close attention and let's go forward and review the, the, the topic of respiration. So, as you can see here, we have a full range of organisms in different kingdoms. And all of these organisms, what do they have in common? Yes, they all carry out aerobic re respiration. They all are aerobes, right? And they all will be using oxygen to release the energy that would be stored in their bodies. The energy that they would have taken in from the foods that they would have eaten, they can all use it. So we have here an animal, we have fungi, we have plants, and we have bacteria. And all these organisms, they need to carry out respiration in order to release the energy that was first taken in, whether it is in the process of photosynthesis or as a, an, a higher animal taken in through nutrition, that energy now has to be released. The preferred pathway for that energy to be released is through aerobic respiration, since more energy will be released in aerobic respiration rather than in anaerobic respiration, the topic of which we will examine on the next video. So our specific objectives, at the end of this lesson, you will be able to recall the structures, recall the structures, the locations, and the metabolic reactions involved in the process of aerobic respiration. We would also hope that you will review the stages of glycolysis the Krebs cycle, and may I say between here, we are also going to take a short view at the link reaction between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain. You should be able to draw, label, and explain a respirometer. And we're going to look at two different respirometers looking at their structures and their functions. Also, we will hope that you will, be, you will gain an appreciation of the importance of aerobic respiration to all living organisms. And of course, be able to answer CXC type questions. What should you know going into this lesson? You should have had a good grasp of cell structure and the organelles within the cell. In particular, we're going to look at the organelle that will be involved in aerobic respiration. We also should have had some knowledge, some pre-knowledge of reduction and oxidation, redox reactions. We also would like you to know enzyme actions 
and basic biochemistry. There are a lot of enzymes involved in this process as there are in many of the different metabolic processes in your bodies. Basic biochemistry, remember, we would have done biochemistry in unit one and throughout unit one and unit two, you will see that biochemistry coming to work for you. It's going to come back over and over and over. So you should have a good grasp of biochemistry, the way in which organisms, um, the, the organic molecules within them, the way in which these molecules are arranged and how they can convert from one to the other. Good. So we are looking at energy. Energy, the way in which energy moves through an ecosystem. The way in which energy is converted from one form to the next. The way in which energy can be utilized to do work. And what is the mechanism by which this energy is transferred in our bodies, in our cells? What is the currency that is used? The currency is this very tiny molecule, very small molecule that is called ATP. ATP. And ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. And you see here the arrangement of this molecule. Good. This part here is a base. This is the adenosine. This other part here is the sugar. It is a ribose sugar. A five carbon sugar and this other part here is the phosphate groups. This molecule, if you recall, this molecule is the energy currency. You know, just as if you, you know, if you have a lot of money, you will not walk around with a whole lot of money. You will store some of that money maybe in the bank even beyond that, you may invest some in some long-term thing like um, land or something. You may store some in, some in the bank, but you will walk around with some. So should you want to go to the supermarket to purchase some things, you will have some of that money there. You're not going to go in with uh, you know, $100,000 to the supermarket. In the same way, your body, you know, the way in which it organizes the energy, there will be the long-term storage, there would be the short-term storage, and there would be the energy that would be readily available so the, so should the body want to do some kind of activity. For example, in active transport, when it wants to use the sodium potassium pump or so, then it would need this small molecule called ATP. The, the benefit of this molecule is that it can break down and it can reform very, very easily. So this is ATP, which has the three phosphate groups, but it can easily be converted to ADP plus the free P. So if it wants the energy that is in this region here, this region here, this is a very energy rich region. This has about 30.5 kilojoules of energy. So if this bond is broken, this energy can now be available to do work like active transport. And so the, this molecule can be broken down and the energy be used to do some work within your cell or this energy can now be trapped and made to reform the molecule as we will see happening within the electron transport chain and other areas of um, this, this whole thing of respiration. Again, this is showing what I just spoke about, ATP to ADP. So to go from ADP to ATP, energy is taken in. So the energy plus the free P energy plus a phosphate, an uh, inorganic phosphate, will give you ATP, right? So you go from ADP to ATP. And as we see here, within the molecule, you have these high energy phosphate bonds, these bonds where energy is being held. Now, and you may say, well, why do I still have to have a molecule? Why can't I just have the energy just out in space? No, remember, the energy, if it is not captured within a bond, then it will be lost as heat. 
So if you break apart like a glucose molecule and you break it down into smaller units and the energy that is within the glucose is released, but you do not reform another molecule, you would lose the energy. And so what the body tries to do, what the cell does, the cell will break apart a glucose molecule and the, the energy that is going to be releasing, breaking the bonds within the glucose, will then be captured into this smaller molecule. The advantage of having these smaller molecules is that you will be able to do many things all at once. So again, if you have your $100,000 and you break it down into a lot of $1,000 bills, so to speak, you can do a lot of things with a $1,000 bill at the same time, as opposed to if you had one $100,000 bill. I hope you are understanding the analogy. So aerobic respiration, as opposed to anaerobic respiration, we are going to see what this process entails. In, within a cell, you have, the cell has to do work. The cell has a number of things to do. Whether it is a muscle cell, whether it's a cheek cell, whether it's a sperm cell, whether it is an egg cell, all cells need energy simply to remain alive. A nerve cell, every cell in your body, once it is living, it needs energy. And so within the cell, you have this process of respiration taking place to release the energy from the foods we would have eaten so the cell can continue to remain alive. There are two parts we are going to look specifically at. You have the cytosol, which is the liquid part of the cytoplasm, and you also have, so you have the cytosol, which is in this location, and you also have the mitochondria, which is in this location. Note that, note that the cytosol is the part where the process of glycolysis takes place. That happens in the cytosol, and we'll see that is common whether oxygen is present or not. This process will take place within the cytoplasm. However, the mitochondria will only come into play if oxygen is present. So if no oxygen is present, the mitochondria will not be involved in respiration. The mitochondria is responsible for the final products in, in ensuring that the glucose molecule is totally broken down. So we're going to see this diagram as it is expanded out. We see glycolysis occurring here. We see the citric acid cycle. And this here is what we call the link reaction where we are going from where we are going from pyruvate to the citric acid cycle, this is called the link reaction. The link reaction, and we will see that, you know, certain things happen there. Again, some energy will be actually um, gained from that link reaction, and we'll also have carbon dioxide being produced here. Then we have from the citric acid cycle, we go on to what we call the electron, electron transport chain, where we have oxidative phosphorylation taking place. And this process, as we will outline in a little bit, is so important in us being able to produce that ATP that we spoke about. Right, so take a look at it. This is an overall um, picture of what is happening within the mitochondria. You will notice there are different parts of the mitochondria. You have the inner parts and then you have the membrane parts and so on. We'll look at the mitochondria in a while. So here we are at the mitochondria. A mitochondrion, singular, mitochondria, plural. And here we are seeing what a mitochondrion looks like if you cut it across. It, it's a kind of sausage-shaped organelle. And of course, we would have known of the endosymbion theory, where this, or, this was once said to be a living organism all on its own. And that is why you see it has its own DNA. It has its own DNA. Good. It also has ribosomes. Normally, you will not find the organelle having ribosomes, but it was a living organism and it had ribosomes. And of course, we have the 70S ribosomes here, 70S. 
that's the size of ribosomes that we have and you have a double membrane again synonymous with um, organisms that was that were taken in by another organism and so you have the outer membrane and you have the inner membrane good and again we understand the differences between these organisms the fact that they were taken in these membranes they have slight differences in their structure so this space here the intermembranal space very very important in explaining what is happening in the electron transport chain because we're going to see hydrogen ions moving into that space and thereby ensuring that we can have the production of the atp these structures here are known as cristae so you see the enfoldings of the inner membrane and organisms which have a lot which need a lot of energy or cells which need a lot of energy like muscle cells they will have an increased amount of cristae because the more cristae you have the more atpas you will see and these are the molecules the protein molecules called atpas these are enzymes which are located on the inner membrane and these are responsible for generating the ATP. So the more of the inner membranes you have, the more enfoldings you have, the more ATPs you will have and obviously more energy will be produced. How are you all? As I said, this is a review. So I know some of it may be a little beyond uh, some of you if you did not understand it the first time you were introduced, but it should not have been the first time you were introduced. This is module one, so we're just recapping some of the things that you should have known previously. Now, we will talk about phosphorylation because you have phosphorylation occurring. Phosphorylation. What is phosphorylation? You will hear the word, and, and that is a common um problem that a lot of students have miss what is the difference between phosphorylation oxidative phosphorylation substrate level phosphorylation and photophosphorylation so what i've attempted to do here is simply look at the differences between them and as we go along we will see some of them where do those are occurring we would have had actually met phosphorylation in the process of photosynthesis good when we had the formation of ATP within photosynthesis, that was uh, photophosphorylation. We formed ATP, but we used the energy from photosynthesis, the energy that were captured in the photons of light from the sun. So phosphorylation, as it said here, is a biochemical process that involves the addition of phosphate to an organic compound. The addition of phosphate to an organic compound. Yes, so the addition of phosphate, when we have ATP linking to glucose in that first stage of glycolysis, that is phosphorylation. Mind you, it is not termed oxidative or substrate level or photophosphorylation. We will simply say it was phosphorylation. The glucose molecule was phosphorylated. Get? Now, substrate level phosphorylation is when ADP is converted to ATP by the direct transfer of a phosphate group, right? to our molecule. So the phosphate group is donated or transferred from a phosphorylated intermediate. Where did we meet this? Where will we meet this? We will see it happening in glycolysis and we will also see it within the Krebs cycle. Right? The Krebs cycle as we will see um, in a little bit, we will see that there is the direct transfer of the phosphate from a substrate from a molecule and so this is called substrate level phosphorylation we are adding the phosphate but it is coming directly from a substrate a high energy substrate we also have oxidative phosphorylation and again we are going to see oxidative phosphorylation this is the major 
pathway that we will produce ATP. It takes place within the mitochondria along what we call the electron transport chain. Oxidative phosphorylation involves the reduction of oxygen to water with electrons donated by NADH and FADH and occurs equally well in light or darkness. So it would occur whether it light is there or not. Photophosphorylation, however, involves the oxidation of water. So this involves the oxidation of water to oxygen with NADPH, NADPH as the election acceptor and it is absolutely dependent on light. So like I said, we would have met photophosphorylation within the process of photosynthesis. And if you recall, we had to uh, split water and water had to be converted to oxygen and the energy that was released from the water is now going to be used in the process of finally forming the ATP. So it involves the oxidation of water to oxygen and of course the hydrogen ions and the electrons given off. And so this is occurring. It is in, in fact a type of oxidative phosphorylation, but it is a specific type where the energy is coming from photosynthesis. Because if you remember, there is a redox reaction occurring within the um, downward movement of the electrons and the energy going from the, the initial electron acceptor to photosystem one, if we recall our Z scheme. So as I said, there are relationships between uh, respiration and photosynthesis. And you may need to appreciate them because CXC can ask you, or you should be able to know, what are the similarities and the differences between these two processes? They are both involving energy movement. But what are the differences? What are the similarities between these? You are supposed to have an appreciation of that going into this exam. This shows a little bit about oxidation and reduction. And as you recall, thi this is more or less like background stuff. But you will see this coming into play. If you do not understand this, then you will have challenges understanding things like the electron transport chain. Because what is happening here, you are seeing oxidation occurring where you have NADH and H+, can be broken down to NAD, so you're removing a hydrogen. Remember, oxidation is the removal of, removal of hydrogen or the removal of electrons or the addition of oxygen. Good? While reduction is the opposite. Reduction is the gaining of a hydrogen or the gaining of an electron or the removal of an oxygen. That is oxidation. And so you can see NADH plus H plus ions can be broken down to NAD, which is oxidized. And you now have hydrogen ions plus two electrons available. And these, in turn, can be used within the electron transport chain eventually to cause the reduction of oxygen to form water at the end of the electron transport chain. Here you see an FADH, and this will come into play within the Krebs cycle. FADH is the coenzyme which will be responsible for transferring energy in the, um, the link between the five carbon molecule and the four carbon molecule. And so this holds some of the energy and it can convert, it can carry the energy from the Krebs cycle to the electron transport chain. And we'll see how that comes in because it works slightly different to the NADH. It actually only will yield two for each FAD molecule. For each FADH molecule, you will only yield two ATP molecules. Whereas for each NADH molecule, you will yield three ATP molecules. 
So there's a slight difference in the amount of energy that they will be transferring. Again, you're seeing this here. Again, it's just to reiterate. So I want you to go back over this video. Go back over, look at it, and make sure you understand the difference between oxidation and reduction and what is happening. Because I know this gives a lot of persons problem. Even into university level, some students struggle with oxidation and reduction, even though they may have been required to know some basic chemistry. Again, this is just showing you again the structure of FAD and FADH. So you see in FAD here, and they're showing, they're showing you the two nitrogen. You see in this here, that is part of two different rings. But then you see when they are added, when they accept a hydrogen and become reduced, this is the molecule here. So you've seen where the hydrogens are born. You are not required to know the exact structure of these molecules, but it just gives you an appreciation of how FAD can become FADH and reversal. So when it accepts the hydrogen, it becomes reduced. And when it loses the hydrogen, it becomes oxidized. And we're going to see this over and over within the electron transport chain. Likewise, this is showing you NAD. Again, you see the movement of NAD to go from NAD and to become NADH. When it goes this way, it becomes reduced. And the reverse of it, it becomes oxidized. Oxidation, reduction. Good. So here we are at glycolysis. That pathway that is so important in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. And you see the word glycolysis. Glycolysis. Lysis means to split, and the glyco is the splitting of glucose. Right? So what is happening here, and why is this process important? This is the first thing that happens to your glucose molecule. So you would have eaten your, you know, your piece of cassava or dumpling or you know, rice, anything that contains starch. This would have broken down to glucose within your alimentary canal. And the glucose then moved from your alimentary canal into your bloodstream via the ileum or so. When it gets into your bloodstream, the glucose then goes all around your body. They circulate in your bloodstream, right, assimilation, and then eventually it will enter your cell. Of course, we know there's a mechanism for it to enter through facilitated diffusion. When it enters your cell, what happens next? This is where we are. So within the cell, as we showed earlier, within the cytoplasm of the cell, this process takes place. Glycolysis is taking place in the cytoplasm whether oxygen is present or not. So it, it, is, it is found both in aerobic or anaerobic respiration. So again, you are not required at this level, that is CAPE level, to know the exact nature of the molecules. But I deliberately put this, this diagram here because I wanted you to have an appreciation to be able to follow how it is happening. You know, how the molecules are moving and how the changes are occurring. We will see in the assessment that we have for a CXC past paper question, you are required to know what is happening at each stage, especially for the first part of this process, because there are two distinct parts of this process of glycolysis. You're supposed to know the enzymes that are involved at least the basic structure is whether it's a kinase, whether it is a allolase or so. You're supposed to know the enzymes that are involved, but you are not required to know the exact structure of the molecule. You're simply required to know whether they would have gained a phosphate or lost a phosphate, as the case may be. Right? Um, so let's look at this pathway. As we said, the first half of this pathway is dealing with energy um, utilization. It's using, it's taking in energy. And so it starts here 
where we start with glucose and glucose will take in a phosphate so you see ATP becoming ADP so we are losing a phosphate and so this phosphate is now going to be added to the glucose so you see in the phosphate here it's added to this glucose of course this is the ring structure of glucose and this is simply the straight chain structure but we are seeing the phosphate here and this is called glucose 6 phosphate because the phosphate is attached to glucose to the carbon atom number 6 then we have let me just erase this a bit to neaten up here right then we have an isomerase involved here because we are going from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate if you recall the the uh, molecular formula of these molecules they are both C6H12 O6. So they both have the same molecular formula, but they have different structures. So you are going from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, an aldehyde to a ketone. And so an isomerase, an enzyme, remember, is a molecule which will catalyze a reaction. So the Enzymes are important for the reaction to take place to, to literally speed it up or alter the rate of the reaction. And now you go from fructose 6-phosphate, you are adding another ATP because you're adding another phosphate. And so you're seeing in this new molecule, fructose 1,6-biphosphate, you are having two phosphates attached here. Why, why add the phosphate? When you add the phosphate to the molecule, you increase its ability to react. You increase the reactive nature of the, of the molecule. Additionally, when you add the phosphate to the glucose, remember the glucose it was in the blood, in the circulatory system, and then it would have entered the cell. Now, the glucose may leave the cell if there is a gradient, but if you now bond the phosphate to the glucose you make it more bulky and so it's a little more challenging for the glucose to leave the cell so it stays within the cell and it is then able to um, be extracted to get the energy okay so this is the reason for this process the series of reactions simply to allow this molecule to be able to form the product that will allow it to get as much energy as it can from this glucose molecule. Remember, glucose was a product of photosynthesis during which energy was trapped. So this energy from the sun, when I tell my students that they laugh, I say, when you eat food, you're eating the sun's energy. You know, it, it doesn't really translate sometimes, but you are actually eating. When you eat food, you are eating energy, the sun's energy in the form of a chemical chemical energy. Remember, energy can be converted from one form to the next. And so when that energy finally reaches into your cell, all your cell is trying to do is to capture that energy that was from the sun. It is breaking down the glucose to get that same energy for it to be able to do work, for our bodies to be able to do the myriad of things that they have to do. Okay? So at this stage, we now have another enzyme involved because this molecule has to be split into two three carbon molecules and so we have an allolase another enzyme involved here an allolase involved in splitting this molecule right and so we have two molecules you have dihydroxyacetone phosphate right so it's a three carbon molecule you see in the three of them in green here three carbons and you have a phosphate attached to it right this molecule is a ketone molecule you're seeing the you are seeing the ketone group here so this is a ketone molecule with phosphate attached and then you have here Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate 
which is another three carbon molecule, but you have the aldehyde end group. Right? Remember your organic chemistry. You have the L aldehyde end group, and this is the molecule that will be able to go further to continue the process. Dihydroxyacetone will not go any further, but because they are both the same molecular formula, an isomerase can convert dihydroxyacetone to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So in, even though you started off with having a aldehyde and a ketone, you can then end up with two aldehydes because the ketone will be converted to an, an aldehyde because of the action of an isomerase enzyme. Thereafter, you, so for each of these processes here, think of multiplying it by two because this is only dealing with one molecule, one three carbon molecule, but it's really two we have to think about because both of them would end up being the glyceraldehyde three phosphate. I hope I'm making myself as clear as possible and you're able to follow. I know some persons will think, miss, this is a lot of work. But as I said, if you were a unit one student doing unit one biology, it should not have been the first time you were introduced to this. It's just maybe you're going over it another time and you may be getting a little more clarity, but it may be reinforcing what you simply knew from before. So this process here, now this second part here, again, we don't go through it in detail, but what you're supposed to note, there are two, there are some significant things happening here, right? So you have here inorganic phosphate being added. So after you reach to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, you are adding inorganic phosphate, but remember it's two. So it's two inorganic phosphates are being added, one for each of the molecules. And so you are ending up, because you had one phosphate in this molecule, when you added another phosphate, you now have the molecule having, each of the molecule having two phosphates. Okay, so that's why it's this structure, but you don't need to know the name of that here. At university level, you do, okay? So you have this molecule. Another thing that is happening, you are seeing that NAD is being reduced to NADH plus hydrogen ion, okay? So you have having reduction taking place. Remember we said this NADH is now filled with energy. And this will not give you energy right here now. This molecule will be directed towards the electron transport chain and eventually yield the three moles of ATP. So we see now, here we would have put in, here at these areas here, we would have put in ATP we would have put in two ATP here. But at this level now, we are seeing we are yielding ATP. Let me use a different color so it will bring a little more. Yeah. So here we are putting in, ooh, not good enough. Um, the, the, the green, yeah. So we are putting in, we are putting, we started with ADP and we form an ATP. So we are taking a phosphate from this molecule, right? We have taken one of the phosphates, so you are seeing, and that is the reason, as I say, I put this diagram because you can see it. You don't have to know the exact molecule, but you can see what is happening. So we are removing one of the phosphate and forming ATP. So here we are beginning to produce ATP. We have the direct production of ATP. Remember when we looked at phosphorylation a little earlier, what we said? When you have substrate level phosphorylation, the phosphate is being moved from a molecule, from an energy rich molecule, and being added directly to another molecule. So this is an example of substrate level phosphorylation. We are forming ATP 
and taking it directly from a energy rich molecule. Again, because it's two molecules of glyceraldehyde triphosphate, you have to multiply this by two. So we have two being produced here, and then later on, we have another two here. Before we make the final product of the process of glycolysis, which is called pyruvate. Of course, because we started off with two glyceraldehydes, we will produce two pyruvate molecules. So we're multiplying that by two. So what is the input? You are, pr you are putting in two ATP molecules. You are investing two mo ATP molecules. And you are gaining four ATP molecules because you have two here and you have two here. So you have four ATP being gained. But since you invested two and you got two, the net gain from glycolysis will be two molecules of ATP. This is the net gain of ATP. Now you will appreciate when we do anaerobic respiration that this is all the ATP we will get from converting one molecule of glucose. But with, with anaerobic, with aerobic respiration, sorry, we can now use this molecule pyruvate, pyruvate this three carbon molecule, to eventually go on to totally break, break apart the molecule to get the energy. And in fact, we are going to get 38 molecules of ATP from every one molecule of glucose. Good? And so, this process is the beginning of the breakdown of the glucose molecule. Very important to form this molecule, pyruvate, this three carbon molecule, which eventually will be converted to a two carbon molecule and join the Krebs cycle. So, why was this process important? We had to break the glucose apart. We had to phosphorylate the glucose to get the energy to get it more activated. We had to break it apart to eventually form pyruvate, which is the molecule that will go towards getting into the mitochondria to continue the process. So this process was very necessary.